charge of the mission. This rack's over here, we have the telescope operators. They might have 40 or 50 displays, uh, windows on their display open to use all the different command modes and, and monitoring and calibration of the telescope. Then uh, this rack that's on the very end of the telescope, that's the science instrument. That's sort of like the camera bot, the, the sensors in your, in your camera. Okay. The light comes through, the, uh, the mirror surfaces on the other side of that bulkhead, that's where the big mirrors are, comes through the bulkhead uh, to that detector. And this is also part of the science instrument team's rack. The science instrument team will sit here. So when we change out the science instrument, we also change out the racks. We have a new team, maybe from a different university or a different organization that's here. Uh, we will have up about seven instruments typically. Uh, we've got some we've flown now, we've flown three, we're getting ready to fly another. And, uh, and the next generation call for new instruments is going out. So in three or four years, we'll have sort of the latest technology coming in and some upgrades. Typical mission is about 10 hours, take off, climb up to 39,000 feet. As we burn fuel, we can climb higher and higher, get above more and more of the water vapor in the atmosphere. The last four or five hours of the flight will be at 43,000 feet, hopefully. A typical mission will go all over, uh, depends on where the targets are, we're always looking out the left side of the airplane, 23 to 58 degree elevation, we can, we can rotate, and we're turning our airplane to get the heading and the target we need to the flight. So, I'm going to let Hans talk a little bit about the amazing telescope. Okay, I'm Hans, I am uh, actually the German representative of Sophia, and Germany owns 20% as you may know, and the United States, that's a... Almost 80%. So we are the junior partner. Nonetheless, the telescope it was built in Germany, and uh, it's quite a, a piece of, uh, you could almost say, a piece of art because it's a, a tricky thing to uh, have a, such a fine-tuned instrument uh, and telescope together. And uh, what I wanted to actually tell you. Is what the telescope does, what kind of science we are doing with the telescope. What you see here is the so-called great instrument. This is great, a great name. <laughs> it means, it means uh, G stands for German and R for, R -E for receiver, like radio receiver, and A for astronomy, and T for the wavelength, terahertz. Terahertz, that's wavelength sort of, wavelength is like uh, more than 100, 100 microns, so that's, uh, that's the uh, optical light is half a micron, so it's 200 times to 500 times the wavelength of ordinary light. And so what are you doing with these kind of uh, devices, instruments, which is a little bit like a radio receiver, but at much higher frequency. What you study is the medium, the interstellar medium. Interstellar means between the stars. That is Winter is between and star together. It's in between the stars, and there's some gas and dust, which is the raw material from which new stars form. And so, one of the things about this telescope and this instrument is we are studying uh, the basic uh, processes that lead to star and planet formation, and uh, some other things like comets and solar system objects, asteroids, and all that. So, in a sense, it's, it's a machine to uh, study what I call astrochemistry, but astrochemistry on the way to understand ourselves. What kind of molecules uh, there are out there. In fact, one of the things that, that, that was planned on this flight going out to Palmdale this afternoon, we were looking for a new molecule in space, which has been detected or synthesized on the ground, and therefore we know its wavelength or, or, or transition, its fingerprint, and then we will figure out whether we can see it out in space and how, how much, for example. That's one of the goals. Other goals, so this is, this is a, just an inventory, you know, inventory, how many molecules, which types are out there, at, at which temperatures we see what, you know. And, but also we study processes. That's something that the layman doesn't normally relate to. We start studying processes from A to B. How does it happen that from this dilute material called interstellar medium, you get a very dense object, which is a star, encircled by a, a disk of gas and dust where the planet forms. So this is this is part of the of the of the of the excitement, shall we say. 
And then um, other things that we that we that we do with uh, this uh, instrument. Uh, what I wanted to emphasize, I haven't perhaps emphasized enough. You can measure very fine motion because it's at such a high spectral resolution. And high spectral resolution it goes with a lot of sensitivity to small velocity changes. So we can measure the velocity of gases out there to less than a fraction of a kilometer. That's a, that's very small. I mean, by, by, by astronomical standards, sub-kilometer per second in motion, sub-miles per second in motion is very, very fine-tuning. And those are the motions that we need to detect in order to see the, see the formation of, of these stars. So, so let's, let's try a few questions because we are... Okay, maybe you have questions. Yeah, uh, let, let me just add that one of the reasons that we go into the... Uh, we put a telescope like this, a 100-inch telescope, uh, in an aircraft yeah, is, is to get above the uh, water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere, into the stratosphere, and in the infrared, then you uh, uh, you get a clear view, basically. So this this wavelength that I alluded to, uh, 100 microns and longer, this this radiation wouldn't come down; it would it, be absorbed. So even, even the highest up, wow. you don't see it. But if right. you get into the stratosphere, it, it it clears up. Now you can also do this in space, and that's done in space, but the advantage here is that in space, you have these detectors are so sensitive, they have to be cooled, and they use cryogens, and they run out. And whereas we can refurbish the cryogens, we can also, this is a very heavy and big instrument, to put that in space would be extremely expensive. And uh, uh, so you can have more weight and more power. You can bring it down, get it fixed, and so that's, not, not really is, why you want Sophia. It's actually is to bring the instruments down right. after they've been up in the stratosphere right. to get a clear view. I would say, nothing is infinitely reliable, so you all of a have to, it's good to come home and, 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 and fix it, you know. But I wanted to say one more thing about, which I had forgotten about that wavelength. What is the power of the infrared, that wavelength that I alluded to? And the power of that wavelength is that you actually can see inside these clouds because there is dust. You've seen pictures of Milky Way, they're always dusty in the galactic center. There, there, is, there, are, there are dark patches, and this is an indication there's a lot of dust, like snow, uh, there. You have to penetrate them. And, and when you want to study star formation, then these clouds even condense even more. And it's more and more dust. And to see inside the protostar, you need to have the right wavelength. And the visible light would never be able to see this. So this is the other power of the of, of, of this wavelength. Okay. Do you, do you use visible wavelength stars to guide them? Yes. Yes, to guide, yes. But there is a complication because when the stars form, sometimes it's so visible. Yeah, yeah. But we, 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 find but, but, but we have actually two cameras and uh, so one can look at a little bit different part of the sky, and uh, so we always can guide you. Very much. But it's the same mirror, the same. Yeah. Yeah, actually, yeah, we have some of the guide yeah. telescopes are actually on the structure itself. Yeah. One of them is through the same mirror. Yeah. We talked a lot about what makes it valuable to be in an airplane, a couple of those things are. You know, we can carry a very heavy instrument, one that would be difficult to put in space. We can carry very hot new technology that hasn't been, you know, a high enough TRL to be flying in space. And we can replenish the cryogens every day. Every day we land, we can replenish them, they'll run out. We can fly for 20 years. We can upgrade new technology by putting in new instruments all the time. So, uh, they really are a complement to space to space health. Yes, and actually, very complementary. New instruments are actually being solicited right now, and, and, and I think Sophia will actually only live up to its full potential when we have these new instruments, because they are like cameras. Right now, this instrument is a single pixel. It just looks at one spot in the sky and gets all the details of that spot. But imagine you have a hundred pixels. It's difficult with this kind of uh, wavelength and technology and some millimeter wavelength to have cameras to do spectroscopy. But it will, it will happen. And then if you have a hundred pixels, you take a hundred times the information. Then, in a sense, we become more efficient. Yeah, I heard me just 
just have they just have to fly. We have one more question. Is all we have time for. Uh, how often do you fly, and what limits? How often you can fly? Uh, well, about, about three times a week. That's well, well, that's well, the potential. <laughs> right now, you're limited by weather. Once or a week, or uh, also by the changeover. I mean, people have to rest also, and, and, and things like that. You you have to fix things also. So it's good to have actually a day in between. You it's could good. fly every day, but you cannot maintain the momentum other than you, unless you have enough stuff, and then it becomes too expensive. Still finishing development, it'll be done in about a year and a half. We are doing science in parallel with that, with the capabilities we have now. We're going from about 250 out flight hours a year this year to about a thousand in about two years. Thousand hours a year of science plus 1,200 flight hours. Thanks for coming. Only a